Hello, Psych2Go viewers. Our guest for today's live stream is Brian Cham, one of our amazing writers here at Psych2Go. Brian is a software engineer based in London, and he's also passionate about writing and spreading autism awareness. Brian has created several topics on the, on the topic of autism for Psych2Go, which are linked in the description. Welcome, Brian. Thank you so much for joining me today. Well, hi, Michelle. It's great to be here. It's great to be here. So can you tell me a little bit about yourself and your background? Well, thanks for the introduction. I think you've covered most of my background there. Um, when it comes to Psych2Go, I was actually a fan for a few years and it helped me a lot in my life. In the year 2021, there was an open ad for a new writer and I actually referred a friend of mine who was a psychologist and he was also subscribed to the channel. However, he wasn't interested in participating. So I applied myself and I sent a sample script and at Psych2Go, they were impressed and they knew that I had autism. Uh, so I officially joined in August 2021 as the first autistic writer to help write autism related scripts, although I've related about some other psychology topics as well. So I've been at, working for Psych2Go as a writer for almost two years now. That's amazing. So you're like a pioneer. <laughs> <laughs> other people are going to feel like inspired to apply to Psych2Go and write about autism. That's amazing. So when were you diagnosed with autism, Brian? I was diagnosed with autism at the age of 16. So at the time, I was diagnosed with Asperger's syndrome after being referred by my school. And even before then, there were some signs from a young age, but others just thought I had an eccentric or a pedantic personality. And it was only in high school that others really started to notice that I had really rigid routines and habits. And the teachers actually sus suspected me of having OCD at the time. Oh, wow. So they referred me to a specialist and they actually diagnosed me with Asperger's syndrome. And for those not familiar with the term, Asperger's syndrome was an older diagnosis for individuals who had some autistic behavioral traits, but didn't have significant uh, verbal deficits, um, which is where you would get diagnosed with, you know, full autism spectrum disorder. And in the past 10 years, there's actually been a change to the official diagnosis and the DSM and the ICD, which is the official classification guides used in the field of psychiatry. Asperger's syndrome is no longer an official diagnosis, but it's been merged into the general autism spectrum. And my case is a little different from most other autistic people because it's usual for them to be diagnosed at a much younger age um, when parents and teachers notice significant differences in behavior, especially things like language difficulties. Oh, thank you for clarifying that because I did hear about that, that it's been changed. And that, um, can you like clarify that again? So ask, Burgers sure. isn't like on the, it, it's like different now. It's like, um, it's all under autism spectrum disorder. That's right. Yes. Autism spectrum disorder is the um, big umbrella term. And that's, that's the pretty much the only one that's official now. Okay. Thank you for clarifying that. Cause there's probably people who don't know that and still think that, yeah, it's like different. And so then how did your autism diagnosis impact your, or shape your worldview growing up or your original diagnosis of Asperger's? Sure. I think being diagnosed on the autism spectrum or, or big guys with Asperger's syndrome, um, mm -hmm. really impacted my worldview a lot at the time. So although that happened relatively late in my teens, it did give me a lot of clarity about why I was different from others. And that made things a lot smoother knowing that. So the diagnosis led me and my family to um, pursue some books and some resources to help me with uh, like communication and coping strategies. And for me personally, it really helped me to be less critical of myself when I wasn't able to do things that others were able to do, especially like messing up socially. And so that way I wasn't holding myself to impossible expectations or impossible comparisons with others, um, yeah. which is what, which is what would happen before a lot since I could see I was so struggling socially a lot compared to other people at school. But as for you, Michelle, um, what has it been like for you to have a loved one with autism and how have you supported them? Well, you know, it is difficult because we live in a society that isn't, you know, as accepting as it should be. And it's always hurtful, even if you're not the one who's directly impacted by it, seeing your loved one be discriminated against. Because the truth is, I feel like neuro the, neuro the people in the neurodivergent community get community, they get discriminated against. I really feel like they do get discriminated against. And I notice my loved one get discriminated against and it hurts me. You know, it's awful to, to witness that. And that's why it's my mission to destigmatize mental illness and destigmatize, you know, any, you know, autism, anything like that, because it's just wrong, you know, to see people get discriminated against. It's the mission of all of Psych2Go. 
yeah, that's, you know, the mission and it's an amazing mission <laughs> that's noble. And I think we're doing an amazing job. What do you think? <laughs> well, we just passed 11 million subscribers. So clearly we've done, we're doing something right. Yeah, obviously. Right. <laughs> 10 years and counting. Right. <laughs> and then, um, so honestly, um, so how did you feel that, did you feel, did you feel that you received the support you needed growing up from loved ones, teachers at school? Cause you did mention your family. You mentioned that your family like did research on it. So do you feel like they rallied around you and gave you the support you needed? When it came to my family, yes, I, I think they did the best they could with what they had. Um, we were referred to um, a lot of resources that we could pursue on our own. Uh, in my case, when we saw the specialist, he said my, my case wasn't um, severe enough to actually go to any you know specific programs or anything like that that was reserved for, for a very limited number of people. Um, when it came to the school, um, I feel that the teachers didn't really have much of a knowledge about that. So um, there wasn't really much of a, of, a, of a help there. And then going to university, they were, they were actually kind of clueless about it, to be honest. Really? At the university, there wasn't like student organizations and more like support services? There wasn't a, an official um, support service for that, but they, they seemed kind of dismissive. Dismissive. I'm sorry that you dealt with that experience. Often that can happen because there isn't always like people who are trained, which they should be, right? Like the yeah. necessary training isn't always there for like professionals who are supposed to help students, right? Yeah, it's, it's unfortunate. Um, I mean, I, I went in there with um, not very high expectations anyway, but um, after that, I thought, okay, I just gotta, just gotta deal with this on my own. It was, it was disappointing, but oh well. I mean, I, I went the first sixteen years of my life not having that support, and you know, uh, I, I, I knew some strategies. That's amazing. So, like, you learn how to like cope with it, and you learn to like be your own advocate in a way. To some degree, yes, yes. I mean, there are limits to what I can do by myself, but um, I, I, I think part of having the diagnosis um, also fills you with a bit of confidence that you can actually um, you know, succeed in this world, even if it is difficult because you've done it already so far. Mm -hmm. And so do you feel like you ever struggled at all due to autism? Like, did you ever experience bullying? Yeah, I, there's definitely a lot of struggles that came with autism. So growing up, my main issues were to do with communication and socializing. Mm -hmm. So a common experience for autistic people is taking comments too literally, and that can lead to misunderstandings when it comes from an authority figure. So one example I remember quite strongly is when I was in school, when I was around 13 years old, um, we were in drama class and we had these performances all planned. And the teacher asked me, oh, Brian, would you like to go first? And I interpreted that as a literal question. And I just said, no, thanks. And then after that, the teacher got really angry and she said, I wasn't asking. And I got so confused by her reaction because I was thinking, oh, what do you mean you weren't asking? That's a question. That's that's how questions work. I mean, why get angry that I answered what you asked me? That it was very baffling to me. I thought it was just very mm -hmm. straightforward. What she was trying to ask me, so I gave her a straightforward answer. Um, nowadays, I have a bit more insight into that sort of thing. Um, which is what those resources help me to understand. So now I know that the teacher was asking me a rhetorical question and she th probably thought that I was just trying to be funny, which explains her reaction. Well, in yeah. reality, she should have tried explaining it to you instead of like scolding you right away. Like, yeah. well, this was before right. my diagnosis. Afterwards, I think they were a bit more supportive of that. But oh, before, okay. before that was just, I was just, yeah. I just lots, feel like. Lots of <laughs> Absolutely. She still should have just explained it, though, like for any student, because, you know, putting a student on the spot. Right. And just scolding them like, no. <laughs> right. So mm -hmm. I guess she could have. But I get what you're saying. So you received the support you needed, like after you were diagnosed. Yeah. Afterwards, yeah. they were a mm -hmm. bit more open to you, giving me the benefit of the doubt and explaining things like that. OK, that's awesome to hear. And what are the main misconceptions that you've noticed people have about autism? Yeah, so the misconceptions is actually the focus of uh, that I wrote about the biggest myths about autism. I think it's the one that's linked in the video description below here. And in my opinion, the biggest misconception is lumping all autistic people into one monolith, 
So on one hand, you have the very negative opinion that autism is primarily a disability and the focus is only on what we can't do, the struggles we face. And there are certainly a lot of struggles and um, a lot of autistic people who need help with a lot of um, life skills. But if you pay too much attention to um, the charity ads, for instance, you get the false impression that we're all like that and that we can't you know, achieve anything in life. Mm-hmm. And that can lead to comments where people might say to me, oh, I'm, I'm surprised you have autism. You, you have a job, but you can, but you have friends, things like that. And it's a bit condescending because they think you know, an autistic person is someone who can't even tie the shoelaces. That's obviously not, not the case. But on the other hand, um, there's also a tendency to lump autistic people into that Rain Man category where we all have these superhuman mental abilities yeah, and we can exactly. figure out these very advanced things on the spot. And mm-hmm. again, there is some truth in that because there are plenty of um, examples of very highly accomplished scientists and inventors and artists who uh, are on the spectrum. So it's good that people are aware of these positive examples and these positive abilities. The problem is if you assume that um, we all have these amazing talents and you put us all on the pedestal, that can set some unrealistic expectations and that can actually deny us understanding and help that we need. So Absolutely. the main misconception is actually lumping us all into one stereotype, whether it's overly negative or overly positive, because every autistic person is different. That's why they're called the autism spectrum. And everyone has a mix of strengths they can offer and some uh, weaknesses where they will need some help and understanding and guidance. That's amazing that you said that because I do think that's the main misconception with a lot, not just autism, but with other, you know, you know, just we just with anything when it comes to mental health, like, okay, well, people who have this disorder are like this or people who have autism have this or if someone and, you know, there's always like people just want to stereotype others. And in reality, it's like, no, we're all individuals and we all come with different personalities, strengths, weaknesses, like you said. So I think that's amazing that you brought that up. And um, what should people know about the beauty of neurodiversity? Well, for anyone who's not familiar with that term. Uh, neurodiversity is the idea that everyone's brains are wired differently. And when it comes to conditions like the autism spectrum or ADHD, things like that, these are just variations to be understood, to be accommodated and to be accepted and not necessarily disabilities to be treated or cured, which is the older way, more traditional way of thinking about it. Mm-hmm. So I think the beauty of neurodiversity is how it offers a more hopeful perspective about the autism spectrum. So although we do have our our struggles and shortcomings. Um, The neurodiversity paradigm suggests that we should think there's not like symptoms to fix, but more just like friction between the individual and the environment that's not adapted to them. Because for those with, for those neurotypicals, that being a neurotypical being a term for people with, you know, typical or ordinary sort of brain structure in the general population, I mean, everyone has mental shortcomings too. Um, The difference is that the environment is adapted for their mental profile. So there's just no, uh, or there's less friction for them. So Mm -hmm. through this lens, if we accept um, autism as a natural variation, um, there's just more appreciation of our intrinsic worth, which can have a huge effect on our self-esteem if we're not being labeled as wrong or defective in some way. And it helps us to retain some of our autistic behaviors and ways of thinking, but to find ways of, find healthy ways to adapt or cope in this setting that's geared for neurotypical people, rather than trying to eliminate the behaviors at their core, which is something that creates a lot of stress and trauma. And ironically, those sorts of treatments can actually create more issues than the original autistic traits themselves. But by accepting or adapting them, uh, we can truly celebrate the differences that make us special. I was about to ask that question (laughs) from personal experiences. Um, that you've had, how do you feel that our differences make us special? Sure. When it comes to the autism spectrum, going back to that, you know, monolith thing, there's no one size fits all list of traits Mm -hmm. that's going to make everyone special. But there are some common ones that, um, you know, are common to people with autism. So one of them is attention to detail, as autistic people are often quite good at noticing uh, particular things that neurotypicals can gloss over. We're also good at spotting patterns and memorizing facts, and especially when it comes to our special interests, which are things that um, each autistic person sort of has a deep passion about. 
and mm. there's some evidence that autistic people are actually overrepresented in scientific fields because of this particular kind of mental skill set um again some of them not all of them and mm. on a personal level as in terms of personal traits autistic people are often quite straightforward and they're quite reliable um especially with a speech um that that can be good and bad but generally it, 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 it's 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 um it's very helpful to have someone who doesn't sort of beat around the bush and just says things straight. <laughs> um, but when it comes to me in particular, um, I seem to have a specialty for memorizing things and organizing or planning things. So that can be that's um, that's actually a, quite a valuable asset in my job as a software engineer because I'm mm -hmm. essentially arranging things like within a computer system or even like within Teams, um, and it's it's it just helpful in my general life because. Um, I naturally try to make everything quite orderly and organized. Um, mm -hmm. That's that's one area where my autism actually, I think, is a good difference. And you're very articulate. <laughs> and so, um, how how do you feel that Psych to Go is helping to dismantle harmful stereotypes about autism? And how can we continue to spread awareness effectively? Well, I think Psych to Go is a, a great platform for. Uh, dismantling harmful stereotypes about just about everything that psychology related, as you mentioned, like every sort of um, mental health or psychology related topic. So we've just passed 11 million subscribers and our format is um, very engaging. It's very enticing. There's a lot of cute animations. And <laughs> when it comes to autism in particular, I was brought into the team to give an authentic viewpoint about that topic. And we, we've already released that two-part episode about autism myths. And that's already been quite effective because our viewers are passionate about all sort of subjects to do with mental health and psychology, even if it's ones they haven't really heard of before. And it's gotten a good response from all sorts of viewers. So it's gotten a good response from viewers who weren't familiar with autism because it explains things clearly for those with uh, no prior understanding. But it's also got a good response from autistic viewers, especially um, autistic viewers, because they recognize a lot of myths in their lives from the people around them. And they're glad to have a resource that they can share with others. So they don't have to keep explaining the same things over and over to everyone around them. Mm -hmm. And when it comes to spreading this awareness in the future, um, that's a matter of our viewers sharing the, our content to a wider network. Because at the end of the day, the people who most need Psych2Go's videos are the ones who aren't actually subscribed to us to begin with because they're not mm -hmm. getting the information and affirmation that they need. Absolutely. But what I love about Psych2Go is that they're always dedicated to like evolving and learning. Like even if we don't always create the perfect video, like we're always trying to learn and we're always trying to do better to help others. And we take accountability for, you know, when we need to improve, right? And when we need to spread more awareness, but we're always, there's like a mission at Psych2Go to always do better. <laughs> Absolutely. I mean, we're always um, reading the, the the feedback of our fans. We're always mm -hmm. looking at the reception that everything gets. We're trying to make a good impact. And if we need to adapt to improve ourselves, then we always do that. Yep. And I love that. And so now we're going to move to the audience segment where we answer viewer questions. I'm super excited for this. So the first question was asked by Maria. She asked, hello, Brian, I'm being severely bullied in school due to my autism. I don't know how to deal with it. And I feel like no one accepts, accepts me. Do you have any advice on how to deal with this? That's a really difficult one because when it comes to bullying in general, I mean, the standard advice is like, tell the school, um, make sure that teachers know um, so they can do something about it. But um, a lot of the times, the whole problem behind being bullying is that you've already done that, you've already tried that. Um, and if, if that doesn't work, um, I mean, I, I, I can tell you from my personal experience, um, being on the autism spectrum definitely um, makes you more of a target for bullies. And I think one of the main factors is that autistic people often don't have much of a support network or a social network, because um, it's difficult this, um, to make these social connections. And I think, and if we're just going through my life experience, I think that once I did actually get the, the tools and guidance to form more social connections, to have this network of friends around me, then 
that um, that helped a lot with um, with bullying because then I have people around me who um, can can vouch for me, who can um, who can who can stick up for me, and if you just spend more time around people who do appreciate you, then um, then you're not spending time with the people who who won't appreciate you at all. Um, yeah. So that that would be from my experience um, how would yeah. we get around it. And that's amazing. So what you mean is like creating a strong support system, essentially. Yes, that's right. Yes. yes. It's perfect. And then um, Adrian asked, do you think that autism worsens social anxiety in daily life? Definitely. Um, mm -hmm. So autistic people, I mean, one of the key factors behind autistic people is difficulty with like socializing and um, communication. And in my, in my experience, that's also had a very strong relationship with social anxiety because um, if I don't know how this, I mean, you, if you remember back to the um, example with that the drama teacher, I mean, if I don't know how people are going to react when I say very straightforward things, then um, that can create a lot of anxiety because I don't know how if they're going to receive that positively or negatively. And there have been a, a, a lot of times when you know I tried to reach out, tried to socialize, only to get like a very strong negative reaction, and I had no idea why. So I've, I do feel like there is a connection between autis, autistic traits and social anxiety, although not everyone who has autism will um, respond in that sort of way um, with anxiety. But I, I do think it's related. And if if, there, if you can get treatment, if, I mean, if, if this is something that's affecting you and you can get treatment for social anxiety in itself, then that does help. Absolutely. And then Tristan asks, do you agree that the impact of autism is greater when living in poverty? How does one navigate autism when they don't have the financial resources to get mental health treatment? Hmm. So this is something that um, that that affects um, a lot of people because on one hand, you've got uh, people with autism who might live in poverty and they might not be able to access these um, resources. But there's also a lot of people in similar situations where perhaps they're in a school or they're just in a society that has very low awareness or um, they just don't have these things available. So we just um, broaden that a little. Um, there's definitely a big impact of being autistic, but not being in a situation or circumstances where you can easily reach out and get any sort of um, mental health treatment, either for you know dealing with autism itself or dealing with any sort of anxiety or any sort of you know, side effects of that. Um, mm -hmm. So in that case, if that's something that is bothering you, um, there are online forums. Um, I believe there's one called wrongplanet.net or something like that. And that's um, like an internet forum for people with autism. And you can share your experiences and you can listen to lots of like tips and advice. And that's definitely something um, that helps if you aren't able to reach out to like professional help. And then Jaina asked, I Jaina asked, I have ADHD, so I understand some aspects of being. So I'll just read this last part. My so I understand certain aspects of, you know, people who are autistic. I'm good at calming my brother down, but it's hard to be patient. How should I help him? Sorry for butchering your question, Jaina. But yeah, so there it is, Brian. <laughs> right. um, when it comes to being patient, um, it, it, that can be difficult. I mean, if you just ask my family members about what it was like um, being with me growing up, um, yeah, they, they definitely exercised a lot of patience. I think um, part of that is just um, giving that person enough space to express themselves if there is something that's really bothering them, because a lot of things that will bother autistic people and cause perhaps uh, meltdowns or breakdowns or, or what have you um, are things that you might not understand or expect at face value. So having um, the ability to um, understand and sympathize with whatever's going on in their life and what's affecting them um, is easier said than done. But once, once you have that understanding, then that can help you to um, manage some of these um, sort of outbursts. Mm -hmm. And then someone asked, is loneliness common among autistic people? Yes, it's probably one of the 
uh, most common uh, issues that autistic people face. And um, for this, uh, I would go back to my advice about internet forums for people who are also autistic, because um, if, if you're having trouble with the people in real life, then the people on autism forums will always be there. They'll always understand. Um, and in my experience, it, it really helps actually with written communication on the internet because you don't have to constantly think about all these other things, you know, like eye contact, facial expression, tone of voice. Um, it's, it's, it's much more straightforward if you're just on a forum. And building on that, do you feel like the discrimination against autistic, that autistic people face kind of contributes to that alienation that maybe makes them feel lonely, like they're alienated in a way sometimes? Yes, definitely. Um, so even, I mean, in my case, um, even before I was diagnosed with um, Asperger's syndrome at the age of 16, a lot of people um, did pick up on the fact that I was behaving very differently, very oddly. And that's something that led to a lot of alienation, even if they didn't have any specific um, label like autism to actually mm -hmm. um, put on me. So I, I do think that is a, a big factor, both yeah, but the autism and also the, the the awareness and the discrimination from other yeah. parties. Absolutely. And then Jack asked, Brian, how do you accommodate someone in the workplace with autism? I think this is a great question because it's about dismantling stigma. So, you know, leave it to you, Brian. <laughs> sure. Well, when it comes to aut um, accommodating autism, it's hard to give any one size fits all answer. Because um, everyone with autism will have their own um, special sort of requirements or requests. So the important thing is, I mean, if you are in the sort of like, you know, HR position is to sort of um, reach out to them and ask them how you, how you can accommodate them in particular. But if you mean someone like a coworker, where you're not really in a position to like change the environment, I guess there are some common things that you can, um, that you can do and one thing that has probably helped me in my work life is um, just to be quite straightforward with your communication. So um, try not to use, you know, rhetorical questions, sarcasm. Um, if, if, if you want to ask them something or request something, um, don't beat around the bush, just go straight for it. They probably won't be offended. Um, but, in my case, I, I really appreciate when people just say what they want from me. Perfect. And then Alexander asked, and this is kind of a loaded question. There's like several questions within the question, but I'll start with the first one. Brian, do you think that ABA therapy is a form of torture? Well, for anyone in the audience who isn't familiar, ABA therapy, I believe it stands for Applied Behavioral Analysis. And this is a form of um, treat. It's a sort of older form of treatment for autistic children that um, revolves around something I, I sort of hinted at before, which is like eliminating or suppressing like autistic behaviors. And it's something that has been quite controversial because of its methods. They can be quite harsh. And also just because of the, the very premise of it, it's, um, it's been sort of likened to dog training, but for humans. And there have been a lot of um, cases where, you know, the autistic children go through this training, they, they come out um, acting more neurotypical, um, which can help them um, in social situations. But at the same time, they also end up with a lot of um, mental health issues and trauma. So it's, it's definitely something that um, has raised a lot of controversy and um, and yes, yeah, some have labeled it like a form of torture. Mm -hmm. And then he asked, what do you, or here she asked, what do you think about autistic be people being treated with electric shocks in the U S? Well, I'm assuming this is related to the, the previous question. Yeah. Um, like similar, with, with like ABA, electric shock therapy. Yeah. Yeah. With, with, with ABA, some of the, the methods used, yeah, it can be quite harsh. Sometimes they are like electric, um, would you say it's that's, unethical? Oh yeah, definitely. It's yeah, something that I would say, yeah, quite, mm -hmm. it is. It's quite horrifying. I mean, I personally never went through this myself, so I've only heard like secondhand things. But even that is, um, it's quite troubling to me. Trying to the idea of trying to fix something 
that is a sort of like you're hardwired um it, it's both unethical and it's practically impossible mm -hmm. and then he's also alexander is also asking what do you think about the organization autism speaks and i know that they've been um at the center of a lot of controversy so yes, yes. so for anyone not familiar in the what in the audience um Autism Speaks is an organization or a sort of autism charity that funds, that has a lot of um, strong relationships with um, ABA therapy and, uh, and, they, and they fund a lot of um, research and treatment based around the idea that, um, you know, autism is something to be cured or fixed. So that is something that has been very controversial and has a um, very uh, negative um, reputation among autistic people, especially because of those methods that we were talking about, ABA and uh, like electric shocks and things like that. Mm -hmm. And then Adrian asks, Brian, what should I do when I feel self-conscious about being autistic in daily social situations and not correctly picking up on social cues? Well, in that case, um, it usually helps to have at least one person in the interaction who knows about um, you being autistic and they can actually um, help to smoothen things out. So if you're not picking up on something, like in my case, I might have a friend who might sort of, you know, hint at me like, oh, I think this person is getting a bit bored of the conversation. Maybe they want to change the subject or something like that. Um, or, um, yeah, when it comes, yeah, so when it comes to those sorts of interactions, having at least one person um, who can actually guide, guide you, interpret things for you, is very very helpful i love this question by edison what are some positive th positive things you've seen or experienced in the autism community and how has it impacted you well i think um within the autism community some of the most positive things are just um you know sharing a lot of affirmation about um about autistic traits and how they can be um how, how they how they can be beneficial and not necessarily um stigmatized so i think growing up um especially when you're not diagnosed with autism there's a lot of um stigma or discrimination around um you know people engaging in autistic behaviors and just knowing that there are lots of people out there um who can say no actually this is something you can embrace it's, it's not something to be ashamed of it's not necessarily something to suppress um, that's definitely something that has been quite positive and as for affecting me personally i think you're yeah, hearing those sorts of um, positive messages and knowing ways to sort of adapt them those sorts of autistic behaviors if they are causing any issues in my life so that um so it's not necessarily a matter of me just like suppressing it all the time and then Lauren asks, what do you think of Sia's movie regarding autism titled Music? Did you see that? I haven't seen it. I've, did, I've heard a lot about it. Um, yeah, me too. Yeah, I, I know why people are upset about it, but I haven't seen it personally. because um, I, I, I know that when I was um, reading about it and reading comments um, from different people, if, you know, they were saying that the movie felt like offensive, you know, to people in the aut autism community. That was like yeah, the controversy. Well. Mm -hmm. Yeah. That's what I read as well. Like it was a very, it was almost like a caricature of mm -hmm. autistic people. It wasn't, it wasn't anything authentic. Like we have a psych to go. And like what you had said about like autistic people don't exist as a monolith. And I feel like that movie was sort of like perpetuating those stereotypes. Yeah. Yes. From what I've heard, it, it definitely perpetuated a lot of these impressions that people in the general population have, but aren't necessarily accurate to, you know, all people with autism. Um, if well, this is just from what I've heard. I definitely have nothing in common with, um, with, with the autistic character in the film. And then Jenny asked, "Has your cultural background affected the way your family, loved ones, community has approached um, you when it comes to your like autism? Has there been like a a difference because of culture?" I think that's what she's trying to get at. A little bit, yes. Um, so. In my culture, 
I mean, I'm from Aotearoa, New Zealand, but originally my family comes from Hong Kong, and mm -hmm. I don't think um, autism. I don't. Th I don't think they even knew anything about autism um, before I got my diagnosis. So having some of that, um, having coming from a society where like no one knows anything about those um, mental health conditions, knowing nothing about autism, that definitely um, made things a lot more difficult when it came to understanding my situation. Um, and when I got diagnosed, you know, they really had to sit down with my parents and, you know, go through some really basic things like, you know, it's not something that you catch. It's just something he was born with. It, it wasn't anything to do with, you know, it wasn't your fault as a parent, for example. Um, and coming from that background, it made things a little bit um, harder for my family at first, but they, come, they came to learn about it. That's amazing. And having their support made the difference, right? Sorry, did you hear me? <laughs> Sorry. Oh, I, I was waiting for you. I thought you were going to. Uh, so what was it? Oh, I was just saying, like, so, having the support of your family made all the difference, right? Oh, yes. I gave a little nod. Yeah. I okay. That. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry about that. And then Darth asked, Brian, I mean, this is going to be the last question. Brian, yes. what, what has been your special interest in your life? Uh, my special interest is vexillology, which is the study of flags. Mm. And I'm actually... Move. There's a flag in the so, back. Yes, <laughs> there's actually a few. But I think I'm sort of blocking it. There, you can see. You can see I love that. Right there. So I'm actually part of a few uh, vexillological organizations as well. Um, if there's anyone from Utah, you'll know that your state flag actually got redesigned last year, and um, I was actually uh, one of the advisors who was actually advising the government on. Um, some of the specifications of that flag. That's amazing. Oh my, why didn't you bring this up before? <laughs> yeah, well, I mean, on the topic of special interests, I mean, this is one of those things that they mean the you know, positive messages from the forums. Like, you don't have to treat this like it's some weird obsession. It's like, not. You can turn yeah. this into something productive. Um, so that's productive, definitely something that healthy, I interesting. Exactly. Yes. That's so awesome. And um, how long have you been into that? Uh, I was into that generally since I was um, around 13, but oh. as for actually pursuing this, like actually connecting with other people and things like that, um, it's only in the past few years that I've actually reached out and, you know, actually um, pursued it, written things about it, um, got in contact with um, those sort of redesign campaigns, that sort of thing. Mm -hmm. And that concludes our audience segment, but I still have a few questions for you, Brian. Sure. So yeah. I wanted to know what topics should psych to go cover in the future regarding autism and which ones would you like to write about well when it comes to autism um there is a lot of um i don't know if you call them subtypes but there are lots of terms that the audience might not be familiar with that sort of correspond to these subtypes of autism so i've mentioned asperger syndrome which is my one mm -hmm. um but there are other sort of diagnoses of uh, some in the past some in the present like um, there's one called pdd nos mm -hmm. so I think something that we could cover is to sort of untangle what all these different autistic related terms are, what they mean and how they relate to each other. Because for the people in the general population, um, there's a lot to keep up with. I mean, autism by itself is sort of a mystery for a lot of people, but then having all these other ones, there's autism, and then hearing about the autism spectrum, um, Asperger's, I mean, there's just a lot, a lot of terms for them to come to grips with and try and figure out. And then just in general, just so that I know, because I'm also a writer on the channel and just um, just in general, what topics would you like to see psych to go cover? Um, anything and everything. Um, <laughs> I think uh, in, in, in the past, I've been trying to push for uh, some more audience interaction stuff. So more like Q&A or advice column sessions, because um, a lot of what we put out is kind of you know, general, like here's some general information about anxiety, general information about relationships, but having something, I guess it's a bit more personal. I mean, kind of doing this here, aren't we? We are we're answering the audience mm -hmm. questions. I have, I think having a lot of interactive things like that um, really helps us to connect with our audience and build a community. Yeah. Our audience sometimes says we have too many videos about sex. Is that true? <laughs> <laughs> I haven't been keeping count. Well, 
just on that, I do have an interview with a sex expert next week. So we got another one coming. So that's why I bring it up because, you know, we're doing more. I'm interviewing someone. It's our very first interview with a sex expert on the channel. So I'm excited for that. Just previewing that. But thank you so much, Brian, for being here with us. It's amazing. You're so articulate. You're so interesting and you're so knowledgeable. And so we really appreciate you being here. And I love your videos, by the way. Thanks. It was great to be here. Awesome. Well, thank you to our amazing, intelligent viewers at Psych2Go. We'll see you in the next one. Bye-bye. Okay, bye.